Well, nice to meet you. I'm glad you came. Was this mandatory or did you choose to be here? Okay, well, good. <laughs> well, good. Okay. When it's mandatory, people don't you know, like to sleep. So we're going to talk about uh, copyright and fair use. I know it's not the most interesting subject. Like Angela said, my job for the DLC is to travel the state and deliver trainings. And this is probably the one I've worked on the most because it's trying to get it a, a little bit more interesting. Basically, it's, you know, don't do it, <laughs> don't violate copyright, and then, but I can't have a presentation that just says don't do it, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about copyright and fair use and what it is and ways you can avoid any problems. So hopefully at the end here, you'll learn, you'll be able to, to define copyright, you'll know what it is, you'll know some ways to avoid any kind of violations, and you'll understand what fair use is and sort of the limits of that. That's the intent anyway, I hope we'll get there. So, first thing I have to say is, I this disclaimer here, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV. If you get in trouble, don't say, well, Darren said this. No, no, no. I'm gonna say, my name is Paul, that's between y'all. I don't want anything to do with that. This is the stuff that we know pretty much about copyright and ways to avoid sort of getting in trouble for the most part, okay? Nothing's guaranteed, but there are ways to sort of stay out of trouble, so. Please, nobody say, well, Darren told us this. I'm gonna say, I, 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 don't, I don't recall that. <laughs> so, it just, all it does really is protect copyright, is it protects the rights of people who create materials. Just protects their right, whether it's auditory, written, filmed, it's just a way to protect them. Now, if you create something, if Angela creates something for Wilson, you know, community college, and she puts it on the intranet, it belongs to Wilson Community College. If she does it for her YouTube channel personally, that's her material. She can do whatever she wants to with that. Okay, it's a little trickier when you work for an institution. I work for the VLC and for Wake Tech. I kind of have two jobs. When I create stuff, it does not belong to me. It's not my property. It belongs to that institution. But if I create something for my own personal blog, that's mine, okay? If people want to use it, they can. I really don't expect to monetize that. But I do have rights as the creator in that situation. So that's all really copyright is. It's just a way to protect you if you create something. All right, we're gonna watch a short video, which hopefully will explain a little bit of this, I hope. Without getting permission or paying royalties to the copyright holder? It depends. 
Even if it's for educational purposes, no particular use automatically qualifies as fair use. You need to consider four factors detailed by the U.S. Copyright Act. The first is the purpose and character of the use. For example, if the use is intended to help derive financial or other business benefit, then it is less likely to be a fair use, even in an educational setting. If it transforms the original, such as analyzing or criticizing the work rather than just copying it, it is more likely to be a fair use. Next is the nature of the copyrighted work. For instance, the use of a purely factual work is more likely to be fair use than the use of a creative work. Third, the more the work that is used, then it is less likely to be a fair use. Even a small portion may be too much if what is used is the heart of the work. And finally, you need to consider the effect of the use on the market or the potential market. If your use might result in economic loss to the copyright holder, then it is less likely to be a fair use. No single factor is enough. You have to weigh all four in order to determine if the use is really fair use. Wow, I didn't know that. Many people confuse the physical ownership of a book or a DVD with owning the copyright to that work. The first sale doctrine permits blending, reselling, and disposing of the copy you own, but it does not give you the right to copy or reproduce the material, publicly display it, perform it, or exercise any of the copyright holder's other exclusive rights. Attribution is another area of People think that if they just cite their source, they're good to go. But attribution is not a substitute for copyright permission. And just because you've found it in a book or on the internet, doesn't mean a work is copyright free. Don't be confused. The public domain only comprises those works that are either no longer protected by copyright or never were. Now, I don't worry about getting permission. Uh, when I post reading materials on our course management system, their password protected, so access is limited to my students. Smart move, John. But password protecting material does not replace the need for <coughs> copyright permission. We have a responsibility to respect the rights of copyright holders no matter how we share their work. So when you say copyrighted work, what do you mean? Copyright protection applies to all types of content, whether it's in print, electronic, online, or any other format. These materials are typically protected for 70 years after the author's death. There are circumstances that may extend the term to 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever is shorter. But not everything is protected by copyright. Ideas, facts, and data are not. Logos and taglines are not. Although they may be protected by trademark law. Anything created by the U.S. government is not covered by copyright law, nor are works which the copyright has expired. For my classes, I mostly use content for books and journal articles I wrote, so that whole copyright thing doesn't really apply to me. Who would I pay royalties to myself? <laughs> are you sure you're the copyright holder? While some authors do retain the rights to their own works, many actually sign over those rights to their publishers. Depending on your contract, you may still need to get permission and even pay royalties to the publisher for the use of that work. Most people don't want to violate copyright law. They just aren't conscious of how the law affects everyday use of material. Sure, but who's really going to know if we illegally share content? Does it really matter? Oh, it matters. It's the law. Violating copyright law can put you and the entire institution at financial risk if a copyright holder decides to sue us. But maybe the most important reason is that it's the right thing to do. Many people on this campus, including yourself, are content creators. We expect people to respect our intellectual property rights. Shouldn't we respect theirs? And instill that same respect in our students who themselves may be content creators someday? Copyright ensures that the valuable material we all rely on will continue to be available for years to come. Our needs are served by the work of copyright holders, and the royalties we pay fuel further content development. That actually makes sense to me. Thanks, Jane. So how do we do the right thing? Definitely read our campus copyright policy. And if you ever need help or are unclear about your copyright responsibilities, you can always ask me or any of the library staff. They love this stuff. So that, that's basically it. And what she's saying is for you to use your copyright, people who violate copyright, they. They don't get up in the morning and say, I'm going to violate copyright or fair use. They just don't know. So that's 99% of the time. It's not an intentional thing, but in the eyes of the law, they really, really don't care. 
So as a copyright owner, you can produce the work, you can do a sequel, derivative, you can publish it, you can publicly perform it, you can display it. If you have insomnia and you need to get some sleep, you can't sleep, read the federal copyright law and that'll put you right out, okay? Uh, so I'm not gonna really go into that, but if, if you need some a sleep aid, that, that'll do it. So this just sort of tells you what the copyright owner can do if you own it. It becomes your property. I can't display someone else's work unless that person gives me permission. Now, if you want 100% protection, I should have changed this to say Wilson Community College's library license, but that's 100% protection. The, the things that you have in your library, if they've done it, well, let me rephrase that before that. Let me rephrase that, because you ever notice that sometimes what you say isn't necessarily what people hear? And sometimes that happens. Let's, if they've done things the right way, then you'll be copyright protected if you use their resources the way they have mapped them out. I'll say that. That way that protects both of us. Now, public domain is stuff that you can use anytime you want to. And Creative Commons licenses, that's what we do at the VLC. So when I create something, say, on like Accessible Word or Accessible PowerPoint, I don't own that. It's for every, all the 58 colleges. So that's Creative Commons. You are free. I'm going to email this to Angela. She can do whatever she wants to with this presentation. Okay, she can modify it. It is not my property, even though I created it. It's not my property. So that's Creative Commons, which a lot of what we do in academia is Creative Commons. So it's something for anybody to use. Now, the real tricky part of copyright and fair use is this thing called fair use, because it's open to interpretation. That's the bad part. It's a little bit open to interpretation. So if I'm in education and I'm not profiting, say I've got a book that I want to quote. So I wanna, say I teach um, ecology and I want to quote the science fiction novel Dune, right? Which is, has some ecological themes or whatever. I'm not profiting off of that. If I'm not fundamentally altering that work, I'm probably going to be all right. I can't use the, I can't recreate the whole book and send it electronically to my students, but I can use probably parts of it. And the fair use guidelines are like the insanity defense, okay, in court. It's a defense, it is not a law that says, you know, I'm protected under fair use. Well, maybe. It depends on how that is interpreted. And a little bit later on, we're going to go through some scenarios, and then we'll kind of talk about whether those are or not fair use. Now, generally speaking, if I use that, that Doom novel just for educational purposes, okay, I'm not charging anybody money for it, I'm not recreating the whole thing, I'm just using excerpts from this novel for educational purposes, I'm probably going to be all right. Even though Dune is, it's a creative work, but as long as I don't use all of it, I use portions of it, I'm usually gonna be all right, okay? And if I use part of it that's not the most significant, okay? And will my using this novel in class really affect the sales of that book? It might actually help them, but it certainly won't take away from the sales of the book. So I'm probably going to be all right in that situation. Now, the easiest way to avoid any of this is if you want to use something that's copyright, call the person. I've done that a couple times. I've actually done it about 12 times for other projects in the VLC. And 11 out of 12 times, they gave me permission. One guy didn't, which was fine. I mean, it was his work. But if you really want to use something and you know it's copyright, it's copywritten, call a person. Most people that are experts in a the field, they want to share what they know. I mean, they've worked a long time on this. So, like I said, 11 out of 12 times, they gave me permission. I just found out who the person was, I emailed them, then I called them. And a call is probably a little better than an email. It's a little bit harder to 
ignore a call. Now, I think Angela, yeah, she gave you that's basically a fair use checklist and uh, it'll tell you probably what you need to know. Everything that we're going to talk about is written down there, okay? And again, it's just a tool to assist you in making sure that you are you are in compliance with fair use, okay? This document you have in front of you is not protection from, from anything. It's a guide. And for the most part, if you follow that guide, you'll probably stay out of trouble, okay? All right, so let's talk about fair use in the real world, okay? It's nice to talk about theory and the law, but you don't care. <laughs> and we don't have time to really get into that. Let's talk about the way it really, really affects you. So if it's direct relation to classroom use, if it's a scholarly work, and if access to that is restricted, so if it's on the internet here at Wilson, so it's done for education, it's restricted, and it's a scholarly work, you're usually okay. Now if you're using it for entertainment, or you don't give proper attribution, or you're profiting from the use, which none of us do here, then that's probably, well not probably, that is not fair use. Okay, so here's some scenarios. We're gonna go through these scenarios and I want some audience participation. You tell me why you think these are or are not fair use rules, okay? I wanna, I'm gonna check for understanding here, okay? You attend a conference earlier this semester and the keynote speaker was phenomenal. You borrow several of his quotes and print the quotes under photos that you've taken that inspire you. You hang the prints around the classroom to inspire your students. Is the use of the keynote's quote a fair use. No. We're using it for educational purposes, right? Is there Good point. <laughs> You're part of the AG group. That's why it wouldn't be, because I, I haven't attributed it that to that person. And that's just kind of, forget fair use for a second. That's just kind of bad, and it's still somebody else's work. So forget fair, it is a violation of fair use, but it's also a violation of basic decency and protocol, isn't it? Which to me is worse. Okay, so, favor the fair use is that, oops, I'm sorry, I went through. Okay, another factor that favors fair use is if it's published work, it's nonfiction, if it's directly related to your learning objectives, okay? If it's a creative work or it's fiction, again, in my first example, we used the novel Dune, which is a science fiction novel, okay? And it was, it's a highly creative work, and it is fiction, but depending on how you use it, it could or could not be fair use. And this is where the tricky part comes in, and some of these things are open to interpretation. My philosophy has always been, if you don't say anything, you can't be misquoted, can you? You don't say anything, so it's best to maybe limit your use of fictional work if you can. Now, here's our second example. And again, while teaching the online technology course, your colleague is inspired to share an article that she just read about the effects of modern technology on the brain. She copies a portion of the article to create an accessible PDF and posts it in the lesson folder for this week's lessons. She offers extra credit to students who post in the discussion board after reading the article and discussing how it relates to this week's lesson. Is this use of the article a fair use? Well, if it's online, there's a potential for it to be monetized. And so when you're taking good views away from the writer of that article, I don't think so. Now this one's tricky because this is a situation where it depends on how you're using it, right? If she copied a portion of it, then it's going to get to be, I wouldn't do this personally because it's going to get to be, well, how much did you copy? The first thing she should probably do is just call the author and say, I, I use this for technology, I'm going to use this for a class, can I use part of your article? The answer is probably going to be yes. I bet you nine and a half times out of ten the answer is going to be yes, with just a simple call or email. I would not do it because this is just sort of open to interpretation. 
So I would not use it without attribution, without calling that person. And I would just try to get their, get their approval of it. So I personally would not do that one. And I recommend you don't do it either, unless you call the person and just say, hey, look, can I, can I use this? They're probably going to say yes. Do you need to document that? Yes. Yes, trust but verify, right? Just have her send you a quick email saying, it's okay for you to use this for your class. And then that way, you know, you archive that and you have it in case something comes up. Maybe her nephew's in your class or a distant relative and he wants to sue you or he knows a lawyer. So it's just a way to protect yourself. That's a great question. So you are, you, you, um, say it like in your course, you have a link to an article. And the students are to read that article, and they may print it out themselves or whatever, and then you have questions about that article. Is that okay? Sure. That's like if I loan you a car and you go rob some place. I'm not responsible. <laughs> right? I wasn't with you. Right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I, mean, I wasn't with you, so, so don't come to me. So if you link it to your course, then it's okay. But if yeah, it's not, well, <laughs> again, is this sort of a, tell me a little bit more about that. What kind of article is it? Give me an example. I'm just saying, say it's um, effective characteristics of being a teacher. And that was the first assignment. They had to read an article and then it was a discussion. Oh, before. you're good. Okay. Because it's up there for poor people to read it. That's why it exists. You're not changing the nature of that work. Okay, so what so. if you just use part of that article in your course as part of like your course, your lecture notes. So you're just going to take like excerpts from that article? As long as you quote it and give the author the attribution yeah. and it's published and on the internet for everybody to see. Mm -hmm. In that case, you're good. Okay. Yeah, in that case. Now, it's got to be exactly like you just said. Give us <laughs> okay. an example, okay. not exactly what she said where you wouldn't be good. Here's a, I'll do that. So an example of that would be Say I teach uh, anatomy and physiology. So I'm doing like a graphs of the brain or, or whatever. So I get one from like Scientific America, okay? And I'm gonna test my kids on this. I don't give any attribution to that. I make it seem like I created those graphs of the brain. Then I test them on it. So I take that exact same graph and this is the medulla oblongata or whatever the parts of the brain are. And I test them on that without attribution. I'm not good. And one of the reasons that people get in really, really bad trouble about that is if you call those people, they're going to say yes. I mean, I can almost guarantee you if you call them and say, can I use this in a class part of it? They're almost always going to say yes. So that's why it's kind of a, that's why you can get in trouble there. Does that make sense? You're looking at me like, <laughs> no, it didn't. No, I'm wondering if I'm violating. No, no. In that case, what you just said, no, you're not. It's there for people to see. You're just directing them towards it. You're not taking that work. You're not profiting off of it. I mean, you're not really doing anything wrong there. Oh, what about this one? A sociology instructor wants to engage his online students more while designing his lessons on social groups. He uploads an entire album by a popular commercial 70s band in the hopes of illustrating the concept to the students and creating higher interest in the topic. Is the use of an album a fair use? No, of course not. He's using the whole album. All right? He can't, he can't do that. I mean, he could get, he could use like snippets of a song, like when you listen to the radio. They have songs, well, if you listen to sports radio, which I do, you have a lot of sports radio, they have portions of songs coming in and then they start talking about football or whatever. But those are always almost about 30 to 45 seconds. So they don't have to pay any royalties for that because they're only using a portion of that song. So in this case, no, he cannot do that. Um, he, could, he could refer them to the songs. He could say, listen to this on YouTube. He could do that, but he can't you know, copy it and bring it into class. Now, if you own the work or you have a purchased copy of the work, if you're going to use it one time, there's no significant market impact and there's no similar products marketed by the copyright holder. But all these conditions sort of have to be met. 
Okay? So let's go back to our previous example. This professor, he owns that album. Say it's Pink Floyd's The Wall. He owns it. It's his. He, he bought it. He's going to use it one time. That really has no significant market impact, does it? In fact, it might help them. A kid might listen to it and say, well, I want to buy that. And no similar product technically is marketed. They have other albums, but not another album of that one, right? Now, could it replace sales or copies of the work? Is it repeated long-term use? Again, this comes into interpretation. If he used that one time, I still wouldn't use all of it because that's technically in violation of copyright. You're using the entirety of a non-fiction work or a creative work, excuse me. You're using the entirety of it. So I, I wouldn't do that. If he used a portion one time, he purchased it, he used a portion of it one time, he's going to be good. Even if somebody comes to him, he's probably going to get off with that. You, you see that distinction, that difference I'm making. He's using a portion of one song. He's using it one time. He's not using the whole work. And he's using it for educational purposes. So he's probably going to be all right there. Another question. Is that one time tied to one class this semester such that you can't use it one time next semester? So if he's got four sections of sociology and he uses it one time in each of those four sections, that's the way it has been interpreted in the past. Again, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> and I don't look good in orange. It's not my color. <laughs> I asked because I had a lawyer present a seminar on legal issues and she brought in three short, I'm going to say, 10 second clips from videos that her children had at home on DVD. Um, three different videos and played those. And my first thought was, is that legal? <laughs> Should we be doing that? Yeah, but it well, was technically. Not for me, but if she teaches for another, she brings us back again, or she teaches for another SBC, I'm trying to figure out that would be legal. Depending on the video. I will say, I would never ever mess, don't mess with the Disney Corporation and their copyright. Don't ever do that. Just stay away from their stuff. They're, they're really, really adamant about their copyright. So if it wasn't a Disney movie, 10 seconds. Again, it depends on our purpose. Was it to illustrate a point? Was it educational? It was to illustrate a point. It was just based on a comment that was made. And then it was to emphasize something else that had to do with legal. Again, usually yes. But again, you have to really use that checklist or that list you've got and think about all those factors. Really think about them. And one way to think about it is if I argue this in court, do I have a good, sound argument? Or could a lawyer make a good, sound argument about this point, whatever your point is? Now this one is, uh, this is a no-brainer. It's Showtime, the school theater group has put it on a production of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. They print out flyers and posters for the iconic Beast silhouette and rose and Disney logo to advertise across campus. They are looking to get sued. <laughs> and they will probably get sued. And when I was doing research for this, I found about this lady in Montana who was, she taught middle school, she taught art. So she put a mural of all the Disney characters on the wall in her school in Montana and they got sued. A middle school. Disney sued a middle school. Yeah. So don't, don't mess with those. Now if they want to do a production of Beauty and the Beast, not use the Disney logo, not use those trademarks that are associated with Disney, they can do that all day, right? Disney doesn't own the concept of Beauty and the Beast, right? They own their particular production of it. So there's a distinction there. They don't own that concept. Remember, you can't copyright ideas or concepts. I mean, that's a fairy tale going back hundreds of years. They don't own that, the concept of that fairy tale. Now, in conclusion, does copyright laws protect the original creator's work? Use your stuff from the Wilson County, from the Wilson Community College Library if they've done things the way they're supposed to. I can't attest to that. I don't work here. I'm sure they have. But check. You double check that, okay? Now, if it's public domain, you can use it. 
if it's Creative Commons license, you can use it. And speaking of public domain, did you know that the Happy Birthday song was trademarked? And there was just a case about that. So Warner Music was making $2 million off a of Happy Birthday, off that song. But now it's reverts a Creative Commons license. Now, this fair use is not a guarantee of prote protection. Use that checklist that you have. Always act, you know, give proper attribution to whatever you use. And if you really want to use something that's copyright, just, just call them. As I said, I've done it 12 times and 11, they said yes immediately. And the 12th guy said no, but he had a good reason for doing that. Would you contact the uh, writer or writers or the publisher? I'll contact the writer or writers. That way I've got permission from the creator. This person created it. Um, you possibly, you could possibly could get in trouble. Now you're making me think about something I just did. <laughs> Why'd you ask that question? You're making me think about something I just did about two weeks ago. I contacted the creator of this work. Uh, he's in Britain, but he wrote something that was published in America. So I contacted him, he said, sure, use anything you want to. I've got the email with permission from him, but I'm probably gonna have to contact that publisher because I don't know what the conditions were. You made me think of something. I think if worse came to worse, Somebody said, we're going to sue you because you used Dr. Sorge's work. I said, well, here's an email from him saying it's okay. I'd probably be okay, but I would recommend contacting first the creator. They know their contract, right? They know if they have copyright or not. And that's a safe assumption on my part, right? This guy created it. He doesn't know his own contract. How am I supposed to know that? So that's going to be my defense when I get caught and be like... He gave me permission. I would assume he knows whether or not he owns copyright or not. I, I don't. So that's, that's a good question, but I would all, almost always contact the, the actual creator rather than the publisher. Any other questions about, did it make sense? Did you not? Yes, ma'am. Opinion, is it good enough if you make a good faith effort, like on your part, you contacted the creator, not knowing if the publisher may own copyright? Would that be okay? From the research I've done and read, people have never gotten, well, I won't say never, rarely do they get in trouble for that. Because you're assuming, and the way I interpret the law, and again, I'm not a lawyer, the way I interpret it is if I get permission from that creator, Dr. Volker Swords created that work. He did it. Now, I have no, his contract is not my business. I don't know what happened with this contract. I know he created it. He gave me permission to use it. So I'm pretty sure, again, all of this is open to interpretation. And this whole thing is just guidelines that I'm sort of giving you. Um, I've had a few of these incidents before, and I can tell you, the wrong way to do if you want to know the wrong way to do something, ask me, okay? Don't ask me to get you out of trouble. But if you want to know what will get you in trouble, I can tell you that. About a lot of things. I, that, that I know how to do. So I'll make sure, just, just call the creator. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so say a professor buys a book and maybe makes copies of it and hands them, gives them to their students for free. Is that... Yeah! <laughs> yes! <laughs> That's copying somebody's, you know... Yeah, we don't know. And, and they could argue, right? Be like, hey, maybe this kid would have bought this book. Maybe you're taking food off my table. My kids are hungry because of you. I mean, that's what I would argue. I'd, I'd pour them out. But I, her and then I'll talk to you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um. Suppose you have a newsletter that goes out to all employees mm -hmm. and there's an article that you read in a publication and you wanted to put the link to that article in your newsletter. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, you're fine on that. Yes, sir. 
So I buy a book of poetry. Mm -hmm. I like the poem. I may have a follow up to the other day. Okay. I like the poem, so I type it up, I print it up a little bit, and I frame it, and I shoot it. The author and the source, the bottom, hang it on my wall in the office. You recreated somebody else's work. Okay, my follow-up is, if I didn't type it, if I ripped the page out, framed it, hung it on my wall. That's right, because you own that. You, you paid oh, look, what's the difference? You if paid for that page. And if I the page out, I'm I not, I, I would tend to agree with you, <laughs> but the difference is in the law. Now, the law doesn't have to make sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to make sense. But the argument would be, hey, you bought that book. That book now becomes, you, you did a fair exchange of cash for that book. I assume you didn't shoplift it, right? You can do whatever you want. You have permission to destroy that book, right? You can throw that book away because it now becomes your property. That becomes more of a property question. So sure, you can tear out that page and frame it. You, you bought it. So they look at that as a distinction. Because in that case, if I, if I go to your office and I see that torn out page, it's my book, I'm like, hey, he bought my book. He tore it up, but he bought it. Okay, hey, great. Rather than if it's... So, so there is a difference. Yeah, yeah. You can't blow it up and make it bigger. And... Yes, you can't. You bought the book? So you're just going to put it and blow it up? You bought it. You paid for it. It's your property now. But if it sits there and types up the poem, even though it's noting the author, prints it out in large print, puts it up as a poster in his office, that's not... Nope. That's not okay. Because I can tell you what the lawyer's going to say. He's going to say, I write poetry. This guy's taking food off my kid's table. Look at what he's doing. He's reproducing my work. I'm a poet. I don't make any money. He says, but I bought it. Well, I don't know that you bought it. You could have shoplifted it. Your ex-girlfriend could have gave it to you. Well, if I see the actual book there, I can assume that you, even though I know what I just said makes no common sense, but the law is not always about common sense. I know that makes no common sense because it could have been done the same way either way, but the law just looks at that differently. It's the same thing with the resource. We pull data off a college website, let's say the state's website, and we take that data and apply it in an uh, application, blow it up, put a student space beside of it, make it attractive to you, print it out, and hand it out. At the bottom, we're quoting where we pulled it from and what organization. That that, that's different because remember we talked about a creative work mm -hmm. as opposed to a non-creative work. State actually wants that information out there, right. <coughs> depending on how you use You're it. You're free to adjust that and place it and attract, make it attractive. And do it. Yeah, for the most part, now somebody might get super upset at state, but for the most part, you're going to be all right there because that, in a sense, that's public domain, right? State wants to advertise their stuff. They want people to go to NC State. So, depending on the how you're using it, I'm pretty sure you'd be fine there. Yes, sir? Hi, this is a mental library question. Jim may answer this. If I get a book from a library or any library and I use it for research, I print it, I scan it, whatever I do, I use it for my own personal research, and that's it. Is that copyright infringement? I'm not making no. No, you're not making any money. You use it for educational purposes. <coughs> Technically, yes, but you're not going to get sued for that. I mean, you're not. Because it came from the library, it's. But it just depends, there. too. Like, some things maybe come from the library. They are Creative Commons. It depends on which library. If you got it from the Wilson County Public Library, probably not. Well, actually, not. No, that is a violation of copyright. Would you get sued for that? I don't know. I can't answer that question. My thought would be, and this is just a thought, I'm not saying one way or another, all right? This is not an admission. I'm not saying it one way or another. 
you would uh, you probably would not in that situation. Now a lot of it, one thing you should have picked up on, a lot of this is intent. If I'm using this for educational purposes, I can prove I'm using it for educational purposes. I'm not reproducing the entirety of somebody's work. Usually I'm going to be okay. Okay, but um, you gotta really, again, Every time I use something, I think, now, how could somebody interpret this? Not what's right, not what makes sense. If somebody was suing me for this, how could they possibly interpret it? Not what I think, you know, makes sense. And this guy I was telling you about, I was using his work. It was, um, he did this thing on accessible math, and I said, can I use it? He said, sure, use it. I've published it in, like, journals or whatever. He has a book. He said, sure, use it. So I've kept that copy of where he gives me permission to use his work. And I attribute it to him. I mean, in, in my slides, I'm like, thanks to Dr. Volker Soares, University of Birmingham. And also I have permission so that, again, he asked an interesting question about that publisher. He doesn't have actual copyright. And that publisher comes back to me. I'm going to say, well, here's where the creator gave me permission. Now you can go waste your time suing me, you're just gonna get some debt, right? <laughs> so it wouldn't be worth it for them to even sue me, probably. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. If I post a link from something someone has sent me onto my Facebook page, Sorry, this is Facebook page. Uh, okay, let me back up. Define something someone has sent me. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, like the, let's say the SBA puts out an article that has to do with an upcoming seminar that they've got or something. Mm -hmm. okay? And I post, I post that link on Facebook, but it automatically is going to pull up the entire article. As soon as I put that link there, boom, there's the whole article. And I'm giving them attribution for that. That's, that, no. No. Because think about stuff published on the internet that way. Think about that the same way you would public domain. They want that information out there. Right? They're not profiting off of that. Well, I guess maybe you could argue they are. But they want that information out there. So that's, that's different. Yeah. Um, I have a question. This is kind of a follow-up with Dr. Doggy's question. So if I post something that's not going to be used for education, I post it on Facebook. You're good on that because, again, you're using that as an educational setting. Theoretically, all the students have the books anyway, and you're not recreating the whole thing. So you're just retyping just the question. What if I do that for every chapter the whole semester? They bought the book, right? <laughs> I'm, assuming, I'm assuming a couple things. The reason I answer that way is I'm assuming a couple things here. I'm assuming that all the students bought the book, that you assigned it and that they bought it, so they have access to it anyway. So it has no effect, it has no monetary effect on that book at all. How could it? They already own it. Okay, if I was in class, could I photocopy those questions and hand them out in class and say, I want you know, to give them a worksheet here, I want you to answer these questions today? Yeah. Assuming they've all bought, <laughs> now they've, they've all bought that book and, and they have it. online is not replacing them having to buy the book, I'm okay. That's right. You're not, if you'd have been doing that when the students do not have the book, okay. that's different. Like if I copied a whole chapter. Yeah, that's, yes ma'am. Does that apply to note your notes based on textbook? Oh, no, no, because what you buy that, so as a book buyer, you have certain rights too. Okay, so it's your property now. Yeah, if you want to tear the page out, you can tear that out. You can throw it away. You can do whatever you, you want to with it then. What you're doing is you're not recreating that work. And again, I'm assuming all your students have it. So you're just giving them notes based on that book. That is not, no, you're, you're good there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so my interpretation is that I'm okay, but I just want to make sure. Um, 
I teach ASL and there's a CD-ROM that is no longer available. I've searched for it. My counterpart at another college has searched for it. What's ASL? American Sign Language. Okay. So, so it's a video. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> so we've searched and searched and it doesn't seem to be available and it says copying is okay only if replacements are unavailable at a fair price or in a viable format. Yeah, so if you, can I make 20 copies and use it for If you. <laughs> Again, I'm making assumptions here too, and don't don't put your fate in my hands. Or I'm just a guy. But if you have made reasonable, I mean, you looked everywhere, you cannot find it, uh -huh. and you're pretty sure it doesn't exist. It's something that's important. It's probably how old is it? Is it really old? Yeah, back in the '70s. Then you're probably the copyright is probably gone on that. Right. Because it's been, what, 40-some years, 50 years, whatever, 70 what? Maybe whatever, say it's been 45, yeah, 45, 50 years. Yes, I would, I would make, I'd copy away. Okay. But I would make sure that I exhausted every possibility to get that. More than Amazon? No, I'm teasing about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's not on Amazon, it doesn't exist. If you can't find it on Amazon, it's, it's, it's nowhere to be found. Any? I thank you guys for being an attentive audience. Uh, and just said, do you want to dim the lights? I said, no, they'll just go to sleep. <laughs> Which has happened before. I was at another college and a guy was just snoring and he was tired. So I have one thing I want you to do for me now. I'm going to give you a, a, an evaluation here and please fill this out. You can be honest. It won't hurt my feelings. You only get better through honest, sincere criticism. So let me know what worked for you, what didn't work. Um, maybe something that I forgot to say or I forgot to emphasize. If your questions were answered, let, let me know. You don't have to put your name and I prefer you to be honest even if it's painful. <laughs> well, it won't be painful for you, but it might be painful for me.